This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by the Jungian Archetypal Dream Journal, available now at the Magic and Realism Shop on Etsy. Now is the perfect time to turn inward and focus on cultivating your dream world. Dream tending helps the process of integrating the shadow, known as individuation, and the Jungian Archetypal Dream Journal can help. For each dream entry, there's space for transcription or recording the action of your dream, identification or drawing your dream images and naming the emotions attached to them, association or how the dream relates to your personal history, and amplification or connecting the dots for deeper meaning and guidance. The Magic and Realism Jungian Archetypal Dream Journal boosts creativity by unlocking images from your personal history and the collective unconscious. You can keep the journal bedside with a pencil or pen, and the black ribbon bookmark helps you find your place with less interruption in the liminal space so you can better remember your dreams. You can also use the journal to create a glossary of recurring images in the blank pages at the back of the book to reveal your personal dream language. The Jungian Archetypal Dream Journal features original cover art by M.K. Stam. And best of all, if you use offer code WITCH, you'll get 10% off your order. So head on over to the Magic and Realism shop on Etsy. That's all one word, Magic and Realism, M-A-G-I-C-A-N-D, Realism. And use offer code WITCH for 10% off your Jungian Archetypal Dream Journal today. The world is filled with bewitching people, and you might be one too. Welcome to the podcast where art is magic, magic is real, and reality is stranger than dreams. I'm Pam Grossman, and this is The Witch Wave. Hello and welcome to the Witch Wave. Happy June, happy Pride, blessed protests. My goodness, are we going through some hugely transformative shifts right now. As I record this, we are in the second week of a worldwide movement to protest systemic racism particularly the violence and discriminatory practices that the police have been engaging in for years, decades, centuries. The tragic death of George Floyd may have been the tipping point, but as we know, his is but one of the many, many, many black lives that have been stolen by the racist people and practices that have been upheld throughout America's history. Now, I know that you are tuning into this podcast because you love witches or practice some form of witchcraft, and it's important to remember that spirituality and activism are intertwined and that engaging in magic is political because it is directly tied to notions of power and freedom and transformation, not only of the self, but of the world. I understand that there are those out there who just want to learn about witchcraft so they can fortify themselves or manifest something they want, like a relationship or a job or a home. But all of those things are tied into politics too. 
Because if you are a witch who is white like I am, you have more privilege and you are existing in a society that is racist, that favors white people, and that you benefit from. Now, look, as a Jewish witch, my family didn't arrive here until around the turn of the 20th century, so well after the Civil War and abolition, and guess what? It doesn't fucking matter, because as a person who has white skin, I have been given advantages and opportunities and the benefit of the doubt across a whole host of situations throughout my life that my friends and colleagues of color haven't had. My interactions with the police have been rare and relatively painless. My access to health care and housing and education and jobs and now, let's be honest, media attention all comes from a system that was built to elevate and fund and protect and celebrate white people and keep everyone else from accessing those resources. That doesn't mean that I and other white folks haven't also had pain and struggles and trauma, or that some of us don't also experience discrimination based on our sexuality or religion or gender or physical ability or mental health or socioeconomic background. But all white people start off in this country with a huge advantage compared to everyone else. Not because we are more deserving or harder working or have more inherent worth, but solely because of the white bodies we are born into. Spirituality is rooted in interconnection. Being a quote-unquote spiritual person is about feeling connected to spirit, to nature, to magic, to each other, and yes, to our truest selves. And if we sentient beings are interconnected, then we have a responsibility to use what power and energy and gifts we have to support each other, especially to support those who haven't had the same kind of access or ease that we have. And we can do that in a number of ways. Through outward work, such as protesting in the streets, and I'll just interject by saying, you might keep hearing helicopter noises as I'm recording this. I've tried stopping and starting again to wait for the helicopters to pass, and they just aren't going away. And as disruptive as that may be, it is ultimately a positive thing because it is a sign that these protests are still happening days later and I imagine they will continue for many days to come and that is a good thing. But if you can't protest in the streets or don't feel comfortable protesting in the streets, that is okay as long as you are doing some other kind of external work, such as calling your representatives or donating money or time to organizations like Black Lives Matter or the Bail Project or the Okra Project or the ACLU or the countless others that are fighting for justice and that support those whose lives are at risk because of racism. We also need to have an unflagging, lifelong commitment to making changes in our immediate day-to-day -day experiences. Where do you spend your money? Who do you collaborate with? Who do you use your platform to spotlight? What opportunities can you give to other people? All of this is outward work. But we also support one another through inward work, through educating ourselves about our country's history and our own internalized racism. 
We do this through ritual and spellcraft and through uncomfortable conversations with the people in our lives and with ourselves and through reading and through lots and lots and lots of listening. Now, speaking of listening, I know that you, my listeners, come from a multitude of backgrounds and have a plethora of identities. But I'm addressing my white listeners specifically right now when I say that a big part of anti-racist work, which let's remember is spiritual work, is examining our own magical practices and identifying where we can do better, where we can support witches of color economically and spiritually, while not engaging in cultural appropriation or other colonizing practices. And I know it is complicated, and I know a lot of you want to do this work because I get messages about this very thing all the time. Questions like, how do I know if I'm being appreciative of another culture or appropriative? Questions like, is it okay if I worship a deity from another culture? Questions like, do I only have to stick to the practices I was raised with? I got into witchcraft because my religion of origin was not a good fit. So what do I do? And I've had these conversations with many, many witch wave guests. And I highly recommend you go back and listen to some of them. But in short, the answer is always, it depends, it depends, it depends. There is no one-size-fits-all answer when it comes to doing anti-racist work in general and in spiritual practice. But I am happy to say that I have a good start for you. And that is to read a pair of zines written by a witch who happens to be white and who is committed to anti-racist work, who goes by the name Anchor and Star. One of their zines is titled Witches, Pagans, and Cultural Appropriation, and the other one is titled Witches and Pagans from the Frame of Whiteness. And you can find them both on the Witch Wave Pod Instagram feed or via Google. And you should order them directly from the Anchor and Star website. And I want to mention them here because, yes, absolutely, white people need to be reading and paying for anti-racist work by black writers and other writers of color, such as Rachel Cargill and Dr. Ibram X. Kendi and the many others whose books and online courses have been circulating widely lately. But I think it's also really important for white people like me to be doing the work of anti-racism amongst ourselves as well. Having those discussions with other white people and holding each other accountable and sharing what we've learned and cleaning up our own messes amongst ourselves so we don't have to burden the people of color in our lives with our questions and good intentions and expectations that they always be the ones to educate us. Now, I'm extremely hopeful that these protests are signaling a collective shift in consciousness, an awakening an awareness, an understanding, the likes of which we have never seen before. Yes, this movement is driven by anger and pain and immense grief. Yes, many, many, many of us are late. But let's remember that this movement is also driven by hope and empathy and vision and love. And those elements are the ingredients for the most powerful magic we can possibly do. There are no easy answers to how we dismantle racism. There are no immediate solutions for how we build a fairer world in our hearts and in our societies. This 
is a lifelong magic working that we have to devote ourselves to every day for the entirety of our lives. But we are powerful witches. And together, we can help manifest an equal, free, joyful world for all. We don't each have to do everything, but we each must do whatever we can. My dear friend and my first ever Witch Wave guest, Brie Luna of The Hood Witch, posted the phrase Witches Against White Supremacy on Instagram in 2017. And it's a phrase that has since taken on a life of its own, showing up on protest signs and t-shirts of other witches who have been inspired by her message and who are committed to using their power for positive change. My guest today, Brooklyn, is an incredible example of a witch who uses her gifts to make artful, activist, musical magic. In our conversation, we discuss the various ways she's been activating witches against white supremacy, as well as how witchcraft has brought her inner fortification as a black, queer, female artist. But before we get to that, first, let's check and see what's come through on The Witch Wire. Who is it? Wishes. Nicole writes, I'm looking for resources on the use of technology in witchcraft. I see the term tech witch often, but when I try to look up more information on the topic using Google or Pinterest, I get a list of apps for moon phases and herbs. This isn't what I was really thinking when I saw the term tech witch. I want to know if anyone incorporates technology into their spell work. Are there theories surrounding the use of technology in witchcraft? Hi, Nicole. Yes, as you may have suspected, there are so many ways that you can explore the intersections of witchcraft and technology. So I'm just going to reel off a few that are coming to mind. First, in your own research, you might want to shift your terms slightly to either the phrase techno-pagan or techno-paganism. There are lots of books and articles that delve into this topic, and a lot of them utilize those terms, so that should be a big start right off the bat. And if you're a Buffy the Vampire Slayer fan, you might recall that the kid's teacher, Jenny Callender, was a techno-pagan, so this term dates back a few decades at least. But in sum, techno-paganism has been used to refer to magical tools and practices that utilize contemporary technology. Some recent examples that come to mind are things like emoji spells, which lots of witches do via texting or social media posts, and it's essentially using a line of intentional emoji to cast a sort of visual spell. I would classify the animated GIF spells that our prior guest, Edgar Fabian Frias, creates to be a sort of tech social media magic too. And some might argue that whenever we use social media to disseminate an intentionally charged image or post the way today's guest Brooklyn has done with her Witches Against White Supremacy image, that that can count as a sort of techno witchcraft too. You can also go even deeper down the rabbit hole and learn about the relationship of programming and computer languages and spellcraft because of how they potentially shift perceptions and consciousness altogether. Now, I haven't read it in a long time, but as I recall, the Book of Lies from 2003 has a couple essays on spellcraft and tech too. And of course, 
Even films like The Matrix or TV shows like Devs explore wider themes of spirituality and tech on a macro level. I hope that helps, Nicole, and I look very much forward to hearing about the bewitching pixels you encounter. Now, on to my guest. Brooklyn is an Atlanta-based singer, songwriter, and producer who makes magical pop music. From the dawn of the earth. Her latest album, My Shadow and I, is an introspective excavation of her multidimensional identities as a queer black woman and witch. She is also an accomplished visual artist and designer who runs the online shop Bebe Vaudu which carries her jewelry and clothing line and other mystical merch, including her viral Witches Against White Supremacy t-shirts, posters, and stickers. And she is donating 100% of the sales of the Witches Against White Supremacy collection to a nonprofit called Buy From a Black Woman, which supports black woman business owners. Brooklyn also hosts the Witches of Atlanta podcast, where she speaks with local witches about spiritual practice, economics, and culture. On today's episode, Brooklyn speaks with me about art as activism, music as spellcraft, and how we can best support the Black community during the current protests and beyond. Brooklyn joined me from her home in Atlanta via Zoom. Brooklyn, welcome to the Witch Wave. Hi, thank you for having me. (laughs) Thank you so much for being here. And it's so interesting to finally be connected with you because I realized that I've been a fan of different parts of what you do (laughs) for a long time without realizing it was all the same person. (laughs) Many people might be familiar with you as a musician. I certainly want to talk all about that. But you recently came on my radar yet again (laughs) with this incredible Witches Against White Supremacy design that has gone viral. Yeah. (laughs) So I didn't even know that you were an artist. Can you (laughs) talk a little bit about your visual art practice for starters and Mm -hmm. what inspired you to create this witches against white supremacy image so i actually did in our witches of atlanta podcast that's on youtube i did the animation for the intro of that and that was kind of my first real introduction into adobe illustrator i'm pretty proficient in like photoshop and lightroom and premiere and after effects because being an independent musician i found it was cheaper to teach myself how to do my own bit music videos and edit them and all that. And then I kind of started to fall in love with illustrating things. This past couple months, I really felt like I wanted to start a online metaphysical shop. We're out here in Atlanta, but basically I'm in Sandy Springs. So out here you get more space. And I started like a garden and I wanted to make my own sage and rosemary bundles and such. So I had already planned on releasing some of my artwork on some different products and such. And then I started specifically that design for Witches Against White Supremacy last month. And then I, you know, when you kind of come to a stop and you're like, we'll pick this back up when I feel like I can finish it and I know what I want to do with it. And then the recent event happened and it kind of clicked. And it was like, because I, for the first time, felt 
really sad and really down and really hurt and a lot of different emotions like the rest of the black community has felt. And for the first time, didn't have any inspiration to write a song or anything. I just was like, I have nothing. I just felt nothing. And it was weird because I consider myself an art witch. And the one area that actually felt called upon was to finish that piece. And I already had the whole design done. It was actually going to be, I don't, I can't remember what I had envisioned in mind, but anyway, I already had the piece done with like the pentagram in the middle and all that and hands holding. And then when this happened, I was like furious and I just was like, whatever, I'm just going to put out there. No one will probably see it. Like (laughs) no one even knows I really draw like that. So whatever, like I tagged you and a couple people that I love to follow and y'all reposted it and it just took off. So that's cool, I guess. And it felt so cool to be heard because I, these past week, have been arguing (laughs) with a lot of white people, Mm -hmm. (laughs) some of them even in my own family back home in Kansas. Mm. And I was raised in a predominantly white Christian conservative upbringing. And obviously I'm very far from that. Mm -hmm. And so I was starting to feel really depleted and like no one was listening. Like I'm sure the rest of the black community has. And to see that outpouring of love and support just from something that I conjured up in an illustration was just like, okay, I feel better now. (laughs) So thank you for sharing it. And Oh, Of course. Thank you so much for creating that image. And I encourage everybody who's listening to go seek it out. Obviously, we'll be posting it again when this episode airs. You also not only created this image, but you're now putting it on t-shirts and other merch, and you're donating the profits to buy from a black woman, Mm -hmm. which is a nonprofit. And I would love for you to speak about why you (laughs) chose that organization. It was cool to see like the support behind it, but then it was like, okay, so what now? Because I think all black people, myself included, are entitled to be mad and frustrated. And I think however you need to process is how you process because it's only been like 400 plus years of like oppression and systematic racism and overt racism. But then I got to a point where I was like, okay, but what can I do? And I don't really have the bone in me to try to get laws and legislations past that's just not my thing initially I was gonna go with campaign zero and I since have changed my mind from that for reasons I won't get into because I don't want to get any sort of lawsuit or anything but I found buy from a black woman and as a black woman that is starting a black owned business it just seemed like a good fit also every year since 2016 they have been giving out grants from the funds that they raise to different black woman owned businesses and they've continuously done it every year and they're able to grant more for more black women owned businesses per year depending on how much they raise but they also have this huge online inventory of like over I think it's 500 different black women owned businesses that it's all in categories too, so that you can choose what you want. I we're seeing a lot of other ones that are getting a lot of attention and I wanted to pick one that maybe wasn't getting as much. It's not a competition, but I don't know. I really liked that one a lot. So it's such an excellent organization because it's a way for us to put money directly into the hands (laughs) of black women. So I'm so excited about that. That's great. Again, I want to thank you so much for creating that image because iconography is really important. I mean, in this age of social media, certainly throughout history, we can think about how photographs and graphic design they are their own kind of visual spell. They really can quickly energize someone or cause somebody to feel braver or feel like taking action or feel emotionally connected to a cause. And the fact that you were able to harness your intention, your gifts, your magic craft, and (laughs) put it towards this incredible (laughs) cause is just the working of a very powerful witch. So thank you so much for that, Brooklyn. (laughs) Well, thank you. And thank you for sharing it and buying a shirt. And 
I don't know. I'm so thankful. I've been looking all day at like all the orders coming in and it just is so cool to see like the money going where the mouth is kind of a thing. And mm-hmm. I do want to know, and I'm sure people have already seen it in your post that like, I'm giving like a hundred percent of the profits. I have been noticing like on like some sponsored ads pop up, they'll say a certain percentage is going to this. And I'm like, well, what's the percentage? And like, are we just marketing and profiting off of like a black death basically and I understand like artists have to make money too it just would be nice to have transparency like if you're only going to give 10 percent, like let people know but I just felt like I want to give all of it because I feel so helpless right now (laughs) so yeah yes yes well I'm sure people are going to do this without my telling them but Please go ahead and order your Witches Against White Supremacy shirts and other art products. It's going to a really incredible cause. I want to talk about this moment that we're in, if it's all right with you. We are now, this is going to air in a week. So right now it's Wednesday, June 3rd. So we've had over a week of protests now sparked by the death of George Floyd. But of course, I feel like that's the symbol that has been a stand in for all of the not only inequities that have been happening, you know, with systemic racism broadly for over 400 years, as you said, but in this moment of COVID-19, which is disproportionately affecting the Black community as well. First of all, I just want to hold space for you and for other Black listeners, the pain and the grief that you must be feeling is unimaginable, and I just want to acknowledge it. I just want to acknowledge it that it's different, that no matter how much I care and other witches who are not Black, I'm sure feel allied with you. It's just not the same. And so I just wanted to do a check-in with you and see not just how you're doing, because I'm sure (laughs) that's a complicated thing to answer (laughs) right now, but also how magic and spirituality perhaps might be helping you through this time too. It is a really strange time (laughs) for a plethora of reasons. I mean, I don't know about what it's like out there for y'all, but our governor here in Atlanta just decided that Corona is not a thing apparently because he just opened everything up. Mm -hmm. And not to mention that Atlanta has a huge black population here, which like you said, is disproportionately affected by that and statistically speaking, doesn't have a lot of the health resources that would be needed if they were to, you know, get coronavirus. So that paired with another example of police brutality towards a unarmed Black person. And then we just saw recently, and forgive me, but there was a trans person. Tony McDade and, yeah. and Nina Pop. I know Brianna Taylor, Amund Arbery. I mean, my goodness. And it just keeps happening. And I think all I can do right now is rely on the craft because that has been something that got me through a lot of the hardships that I've faced, specifically like with racism. Like I grew up, like I said, in a predominantly white school, there was not very many black people at all. I mean, I would say it was like 90% white. And I encountered my fair share of racist remarks and things like that. And, you know, I wasn't like an out and didn't even realize I was practicing witchcraft at the time. Because like I said, for me, it's music and art. For me, writing songs are like writing spells, whether you're trying to banish something out or whether you're trying to bring in blessings or what have you, like music is a form of spell work for me, unbeknownst to me during that time. And then up until now, of course. And so that's something that I'm trying to really lean heavy into right now because it is really heavy. And I think you do have a lot of Black people right now feeling like their voice hasn't been heard like it needed to be. Maybe in a way, in a really sad way, 
coronavirus has helped because people have no choice but to sit down and listen because you can't really go any, you can't really do anything. And most people are scrolling on Facebook and Instagram all the time. So you have to watch those videos and you have to like witness how many people are continuing to post it. It's hard to get away from it. I'm feeling better today, but this past week has not been fun. I think, like I said to you earlier, I've been arguing on and off with people back home from Kansas that just don't get it. (laughs) And it's tiring. And so I'm thankful for the white allies out there that are like, I got you, fam. Like, I'll take it from here because it's like getting like abused and then having to sit there and argue with somebody that is essentially like a victim blamer, then you're already having to harness so much grief from experiencing the shit. Sorry. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Oh, we curse here. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) And then you have to like explain yourself after that. So it's rough, (laughs) but I'm thankful for people that are actually taking the time to listen and to hear, because that is the biggest thing I think for a lot of people in the black community is just listen to us. Like, don't be so quick to get defensive, like just listen and empathize, you know? Absolutely. Well, the words I'm so sorry are just like, so paltry. (laughs) It doesn't begin to cover it, but my heart aches next to yours. Well, I do appreciate it. And I know what the sentiment means. And that really does mean a lot. I really do appreciate it. Well, I want to talk about the South. I want to talk about (laughs) living in Atlanta and the witchcraft scene down there. I believe you're my first witch from Atlanta that's been on the witch wave. (laughs) So can you shed a little light on what the witchcraft community is like where you are? Yeah, it's different out here because it's still the South. So what I have found, because I've lived here six years now, is that people won't really be outward about it. They won't be overt about it. Usually what happens is you'll be at like maybe like a metaphysical store and you'll see somebody and you're like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And you spark up a conversation or like my co-host in Witches of Atlanta which mama is her handle. She opened up a store called ATL Craft, which is now no longer a physical shop, but it still is a resource for building a community here. They have workshops and classes. And she was one of the first people that really helped me to realize that I was a witch. (laughs) And so a lot of times the people that you meet are through a lot of those gatherings, like full moon gatherings and classes and workshops. That's how we reel you in. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> 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 but it's still hard. And she could tell you, and I've experienced it too, that's still the Bible belt. And there are still unsolicited, you're going to hell messages that you will get. <laughs> And she got a lot of them when she first opened up that shop off Edgewood in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And Atlanta is a safe haven. So for it to be like that, even in Atlanta, you know that once you get outside of the perimeter, it's just worse, like a lot worse. Mm-hmm. So it's hard, but it makes our community, I feel like even stronger because we hold on tight to it because it's such a hard thing to come out about and be open about. So luckily Atlanta is like a little safe haven. I think it would be a lot harder outside of (laughs) the perimeter. Like for example, if I go visit my partner's family out in like Conyers, Georgia, there are like Confederate flags everywhere. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) fun right yeah and I say that obviously very sarcastically I have a very nervous laugh and that's what got me in trouble a lot in school because it (laughs) it is very uncomfortable I will say that that sounds tough well I want to talk about your witchy origin story after (laughs) the break we're gonna take a very quick one and we'll be right back Look, it's hard enough grappling with our own emotions under ordinary circumstances, but even more so when the world is going through massive collective challenges. 
I am so grateful for my therapist. And even though I've done sessions in person for years, I've been pretty amazed at how effective online therapy has been for me right now. And so I can heartily recommend BetterHelp an online counseling service which can provide you with your own licensed professional therapist to talk to via video or phone sessions. So if you have anxiety issues like I do, or are dealing with depression, stress, trauma, grief, or even just day-to-day -day struggles with your relationships or your family, or just feeling like you're not meeting your personal goals right now, which, let's be honest, has been very difficult for most of us these days. I really encourage you to reach out to the folks at BetterHelp. They will connect you with a counselor that you can start chatting with in under 24 hours. Now, a few things I really appreciate about BetterHelp is that it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, plus they offer financial aid to those who qualify, and they make it super easy to change counselors so you can find one that you really click with. Best of all, which wave listeners, that's you, get 10% off your first month of counseling by going to betterhelp.com slash witchwave. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash witchwave. I believe that all human beings can benefit from therapy. I certainly have myself, and I'm so glad that it's becoming more accepted and more accessible to do so. So please pop over to betterhelp.com slash witchwave and find a great counselor to talk to. BetterHelp is confidential, convenient care, and you, my friend, deserve that. Welcome back to The Witch Wave. Today, I'm speaking with Brooklyn. First of all, we just skated right by your name. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> or I should say I skated right by your name. I'm living here in Brooklyn. Hey. You are down in Atlanta. How did you come by this beautiful name? Although you spell it with two N's. Mm -hmm. You need that extra N. Yeah. <laughs> My mom likes to make things difficult for me to get a mug with my name spelled right. <laughs> Actually, my sister's name is Sydney and it's spelled C-Y-D-N-E-E. -E. So hers is like way worse. Um, wow, yeah. beautiful. Yeah, I mean, now we like it, but before we were just like, why? Why? Yeah. <laughs> Wow. And then how did she come to the names Brooklyn and Sydney? Are these places she felt a connection to or um, just was dreaming about? You know, I honestly never asked her. And I know she's never been to Sydney. So I know that. I don't know if there really was a reason. I think she just likes the way it sounds, <laughs> is my guess, because she's yeah. never been to Sydney. And I don't know if she's ever been to Brooklyn. So, <laughs> well, I'm know. very fond of your name, I must say. It is Thank beautiful. You. <laughs> so, there's little Brooklyn. Were you born in Kansas? Well, I was born in Duncan, Oklahoma, and okay. raised in Wichita, Kansas. So, most of my life was in Wichita, Kansas. Yeah. And Wichita has a witchy sounding name. <laughs> yeah. <Isn't that> great? <laughs> Did the little witch Brooklyn in Wichita? Did you realize that you had any kind of witchy tendencies or predilections back when you were a kid? How did this all develop for you? I definitely had a taking towards the occult. I was never allowed to act on anything witchy at all, though, because I was raised in a Christian conservative household. But I would make, I'd go out in the backyard at my great grandpa's house who I'd 
go over there like all the time and I'd make my little potions and my little tinctures and I'd harvest, you know, different things. They had a weeping willow in the backyard and that was my favorite place to hang out. Mm. One time where one of the neighborhood friends of mine Oh my gosh, I can't believe I did this. But so I was little, okay? So I didn't know. But (laughs) I was really into making potions or tinctures or what have you. And I was like, okay, we have to see if it heals you, if it works. And so I was like, you have to like cut your hand and we'll we'll try it. And so she like, it wasn't like a big, gruesome, bloody thing. But she like gave herself, I think just like a paper cut or something. And I poured it in there. And she, she was like, ow, it stings. And I was like, that means it's working. (laughs) Wow. I think there was probably some like stuff from under the kitchen sink in there. So that probably (laughs) wasn't a really good potion. I was still learning. We all make mistakes. It's okay. Yeah. (laughs) And so I know eventually you ended up finding this store, Craft ATL. Was there something that called you to that store? I mean, when did you come out of the room closet (laughs) and what pulled you out? You know, what brought you to that shop of your friends that you mentioned earlier? So I moved here six years ago and was struggling because I was still Christian and, and I have no hard feelings to whatever people practice. But I am part of the LGBTQ plus community. And so I was really struggling with how those two could coexist, especially since I was raised like fundamentalist Christian, meaning we took the Bible literally. And there were scriptures in there like thou shalt not lay with a man as he lie with a woman and all these things. And so I was just like really struggling with, okay, but I like girls. So like... Mm -hmm but I love God. Like, what do I do? (laughs) Like, Uh and so that was like the first step. And then when I got to Atlanta, I just started researching initially how to be Christian and be gay (laughs) and like, how could I make it work? But with a literal, and I know not all Christians have a fundamentalist perspective of the Bible, but I did. And so, Uh but the more I researched, the more I just fell out of it, but I still felt this connection to nature and to the universe, what have you. And my partner worked with Haley at a restaurant. And Haley's the owner of ATL Craft? She owns ATL Craft Shop. Yeah. And so at one point, any she was starting it up. So I would come around her more and I was kind of getting into Wicca because I think that's where everybody kind of starts out at, but a lot of people Mm do. And so I I had already began kind of reading into like Buddhism and Wicca. Those were the two ones that were my exit out of Christianity. And it was just like everything fell in line because then she started the shop and then I would hang out there and then I would talk to her all the time. And she kind of became like a really good friend and a mentor and like the rest is just history I just was like okay well I'm a witch so that was yeah (laughs) yeah amazing amazing is your partner a practitioner as well no he loves like all the witchy stuff I do and in fact I think one of my altars takes up like half our bedroom and he's very supportive and He's not like religious either. He's very spiritual too. Yeah. Was this the partner that introduced you to Haley? Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure I'm tracking all the steps. (laughs) That's really beautiful that someone who's not a witch can sort of (laughs) link you to witchcraft because Mm -hmm. spirit works in mysterious ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're... A black woman, you identify <laughs> as part of the LGBTQ plus community, you are a witch. I mean, <laughs> those are a lot of amazing <laughs> things to be, but also potentially risky things mm-hmm. to be. Yeah. Especially, I'd imagine, in the South or in parts of the world that do have these more fundamentalist standpoints. So, I'd love to hear how you're navigating that, you know, through your music and through magic right now. 
Yeah, it's not been easy, especially with like, obviously, the South is a given that that's gonna inherently just make things a little difficult. But I've been able to kind of like, dodge and burn those you're going to hell messages pretty easily now. And they don't really bother me as much. I'm just like that. Thank you. I'll add Mm -hmm. that to the collection. But the other part that has been a little bit challenging is with music. I have really struggled with how vocal do I want to be about being a practicing witch? Will that ruin my chances of certain things? You know, is that going to ostracize a certain like demographic of people? But do I even want those people? Mm -hmm. And there was one Mm -hmm. like example that really made it for a minute there for me kind of difficult to want to talk about it very much. And that was, I was still signed to an indie label at the time. So it would have been like 2013. And I had a interview with Teen Vogue and we went to New York and we went to the office and the guy that interviewed me was super cool. His name is Maxwell and he's awesome. I did the whole thing. I wore, <laughs> so the investors at the time didn't like that I was wearing all black, but like, I actually really do like black a lot and it matches everything. Mm-hmm. They wanted me to be lighter and and the songs I, w- I was writing to were kind of like they thought were too depressing and dark, but that's what I write. Yeah. <laughs> and not all of them are dark, but anyway, so I was already struggling with a little bit of a conflict within the label at the time, but I went ahead and just because I'm an Aries and I'm a fire sign, I wore a pentagram. <laughs> yeah. <Yes! laughs> I can find the photo and I'll send it to you. I ha- I just didn't care. I was like, and it got published in the thing. It was artists that should be on your radar. And I just didn't care. I was like, I'm going to wear it, whatever. And I got in trouble for it. <laughs> in what way? Well, later I had a sit down talking to from the guy that owned the label at the time. And he was like, you know, the investors are on my butt and you wore a pentagram and you're wearing it. It was like a whole thing they thought I was being too dark and too this and it was just wow it was so silly I felt like I didn't have autonomy it's weird because I bet you if I went in there wearing a cross no one would say anything oh I'm sure but, not. yeah but we like to demonize witches in this of country, course so I also wonder if things have changed even within the last seven years now that we've had other musicians I know Azalea Banks is very problematic, but <laughs> between like her and Lord and mm-hmm. is isn't Zolita like isn't she also like a witch? I'm pretty sure she's a witch. Oh, I'm gonna have to look. Yeah, into that. there's more of them coming out now. It's nice. <laughs> uh, and there are so many, and or at least people who have said they've practiced some form of witchcraft or are kind of like witch adjacent. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I wonder if now you would have had a very different kind of meeting, you know, now that witches are fashionable, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would have been nice. (laughs) Exactly. Well, your music is so beautiful. You are such an incredible singer and player and writer. Thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. I would love to talk about, first of all, your most recent full-length album, My Shadow and I. You have an opening track on there (laughs) that I am so in love with. The whole album is fabulous, but I must admit I really love the first (laughs) track, Mystic Woman. You have this one line in there. My Lady King energy is feeling fine. (laughs) And I love it so much. I love the whole song. It's super witchy. But that line in particular, the way you're kind of blurring genders and energies and archetypes, I just find really, really powerful. So can you talk, first of all, about that song Mm -hmm. and about the wider (laughs) album after? Yeah, uh, that one, I produced that whole track and I started it out by doing a lot of like vocal sounds so you can kind of hear some of the (sighs) things like that because I'm I don't know I just think music is such a huge form of spell crafting that it gets overlooked and putting that into it my own breath and stuff felt like it, it needed to be done but also like I don't know I just really wanted something that was like 
overtly like, Hey, I'm a witch. Yes. But I wanted it to be something fun to dance to or work out to, or drink to, I don't care. Like whatever you want to do, run around (laughs) naked to, because there are a lot of more melodramatic witchy songs and I do those too, but I wanted something that was like, if I want to like, turn up and get ratchet and still be a witch like I can do that to that hell song, yeah so. <laughs> yeah that's what that is and then the whole concept of my shadow and I was I've heard you talk about it too with different people on the podcast about like that balance of light and dark and how mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be such a polarity and one is not necessarily like right or wrong everything is that aspect and so that whole record I was trying to encapsulate like struggling with that internal balance of my shadow self because for so long I had suppressed it and so that's probably why you like some of the songs are a little darker (laughs) is because it was like a kind of a darker thing (laughs) for me yeah yeah and where was that coming from do you think where were those songs coming from (laughs) they were coming from years and years of my therapist says it's called religious trauma syndrome. <laughs> a lot of suppressing of my sexuality. Like I knew I liked women long before I knew I liked men. And I mm-hmm. believe that if, I don't know, like if my family wouldn't have so early on raised me in a church where literally I would hear from the pastor about how it's wrong. I don't know that I would even know I liked men, <laughs> to be honest. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't think I'd be aware that that was like an option, but I do. You can't like deny what your sexuality is. So mine's very fluid and I border between saying bisexual or pansexual because I do feel like I wouldn't care what you identify as or what genitalia you were born with. I just wouldn't give a shit. Like I wouldn't. So I guess I'm more pansexual. I know in the past I've said bi, but upon further investigation, I think that's more the case. I just never talked about a lot of it because I didn't ever want to offend my family and I never wanted them to feel bad or whatever because they are a lot more progressive now and they're really cool people. But I'm glad to hear that I was yeah. going to ask. They have since moved to a completely different church and the church they go to does a lot of outreach and it's in like the inner city part of downtown and it's like night and day. (laughs) So it's really nice. Even they called me to talk to me and check in with me ever since all this with George Floyd and the whole Black Lives Matter movement has happened. Like my aunt called me and was like, I just want to hear you talk what's on your heart because I feel like we need to listen. And we sat there and we like, cry together and so they've come a really really long way and I think I have too we're all growing and evolving but that's where a lot of the music even still that I'm releasing I I just didn't feel like I could do like a really long album because people's attention spans including mine are very short so even Mm. some of the ones that are coming out now like I can't breathe are an extension of facing that kind of shadow self in the darker side of life so it's interesting because when I was doing my research for this interview and I I saw that new single I can't breathe I was like oh my goodness she must have just written this and of course Eric Garner uttered those words sadly several years ago before his life was taken by the police so I'm certainly well aware that that phrase unfortunately, has been reverberating in our recent history. But yeah, I assumed that you like had just written that song. And then I checked the date. And I'm like, Oh, this is from even before Mm -hmm. what's recently happened with George Floyd. So it's a beautiful song. Can you talk a bit about how it came to be? Yeah, it's just weird how the whole world and universe works. I mean, I wrote that one like, Oh, my gosh, months and months and months ago and then you know how music works it takes time to finally get it out but sure then when this happened it was just put the song in an even darker like it hits home even more now because it's so recent and it's so fresh it's like a fresh wound for everybody in the black community but when I wrote it I was writing about like it was on the topic of race because I was talking about my own experiences growing up and like 
not feeling like I had a voice and always feeling like I kind of had to, especially around like white people, like I had to silence or find a way to craft what I wanted to say better or no one would listen to me. And it's very much about that. But now I feel like it's taken on a new meaning because of what's going on. And I think like there's one lyric I put in it where it's like, you're so prepared, but life ain't fair. Don't you know, you'll never feel home. And you talk too much, you said enough, we've heard enough from you. And I feel like that's what I'm hearing so much from people that aren't trying to listen to the Black Lives Matter movement. Like, don't you know, you'll never feel home. Like, we didn't even want to be here. We got brought here. And this is Mm -hmm. our home. And it doesn't even feel like home. It doesn't matter how prepared you are with things like you have so many examples of systematic oppression, like with police brutality and the redlining district and housing loans and all these things. And it doesn't matter how fucking hard black people try to do everything that we're supposed to do. It never feels like home. It's never enough. And you do have the few that can make it out, but for a majority, it's just not that way. And then when I say like, you talk too much, you said enough, that's like how I'm feeling when you say Black Lives Matter, follow it with, well, but all lives matter. And it's like, you don't even want to hear anything I'm saying. Like, you're you're basically saying like, shut up, you talk too much, like, just get over it, move on. So it has taken on like an even harsher and more hurtful meaning because of what's going on right now and has been going on. This is nothing new. I, again, like, I just really feel like Corona is like forcing everybody to have to like, look at it and sit with it. But that song, yeah, initially was about my own like experience and what I felt, what my lived experience was being a black woman. And now it's just like, even sadder now, I don't know. Well, in the last episode, I had a guest on Kim Krantz, the artist behind the Wild Unknown Tarot and many other things. And we were talking about the value of sad songs because a sad song is a way that you've taken grief or pain and turned it into something beautiful and into a spell that can help if not heal other people, at least bring them some comfort or make them feel less alone. And when I listen to I Can't Breathe, I can imagine so many other listeners who would feel not comforted by the song. I want to be very careful in how I'm phrasing it, but who will feel less alone and who will get perhaps even some clarity that they haven't had or or feel like, you know, you know them and they know you mm-hmm. in that kind of sonic spell space. Sometimes you 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 need to just sit with pain and sit with those emotions that are not fun to sit with in order to process, in order to move forward or have, I mean, I don't know if Black America will ever really have any real form of closure, but for lack of better words, to at least try to get some closure on the whole thing. Yeah, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Like sad songs completely have a place. And when I go back and listen to old songs I wrote when I was like 14 or whatever, they were all dark and all sad because like I grew up in like a broken home and all that but they comforted me in a way because it was like relinquishing that out into the universe. And then when I started to realize other people that could help them in some way process, it meant more to me. It's very true that like sad songs wholeheartedly have a place and have a space that's really important for sure. Mm. On that note, we're going to take a very quick break and we'll be right back. Hello, Witch Wave listener. I am so thrilled to finally unveil the Witch Wave Patreon. By becoming a Witch Wave patron, you'll get to access Witch Wave Plus, which has bonus episodes and ad-free full-length episodes. You'll also be able to join our members-only digital coven, where we'll be doing live video chats, sharing witchy news and tips, and where you can meet other Witch Wave kindred spirits. 
head on over to patreon.com slash witchwave to check out all of this and many other rewards. And thank you so much in advance for choosing to support the show. I truly appreciate it, and I can't wait to make some more magic with you. Welcome back to the Witch Wave. Today I'm speaking with Brooklyn. So Brooklyn, we were talking about music as a spell, and I would love to get a sense of how your magic and your music more specifically overlap, and maybe how they don't. Are you also doing what one might think of as more quote-unquote traditional spells (laughs) are you celebrating the pagan holidays like how does your witchcraft express itself these days on all fronts yeah I would say there's like also a big part of my craft that doesn't necessarily include music and art like I still will go gather my herbs and anoint the candle and light it and all that stuff. Like I still do all of that, like the old school kind of witchcraft, if you will. And I recently I've been trying to learn a lot about the African diaspora of, you know, root work and conjure. I don't claim to be like a hoodoo practitioner or anything like that, because that is a very revered and respected place to be. But I have been learning a lot more from one of my favorite people. Her name is Co Meadows, the Hoodoo Queen, and she's in Mobile, Ooh. Alabama. It's been in her lineage, like root work and conjure for like hundreds of years. So like she is amazing, genuine woman. I love her. <laughs> can you say her name again yeah. so listeners can find her? Her name is Co C O Meadows like how it's spelled Mm -hmm. the hoodoo queen and she's got like a youtube channel she talks about like traditional root work conjure she'll even give you one minute witch tips she came and was on witches of atlanta episode one and Mm. she is a amazing black woman that i wanted to learn more from like my people (laughs) you know of course so recently i've been like incorporating more of those types of conjure and spell work into my craft so yeah there's definitely areas where they don't really intersect at all but there are times where it is a huge part and sometimes I feel like if I sing a spell out it does better for me than if I recite it because I think I believe it more and I feel intertwined with it more and I feel like it's just different you know everyone's got their own way yeah she's amazing I will like plug her all the time to the day I die so (laughs) he sounds incredible yeah and I I love what you're saying about singing a spell and how that sometimes feels like it's activating more you know there's that word somatic that Mm -hmm. I think comes up a lot in these conversations which is essentially about like your body's relationship to something and I always try to tell people that magic is embodied and it's of the body. So like how you feel when you're casting a spell is part of the intention. Sure, you want to think Mm -hmm. about what your intention is or visualize it. But if you can get your energy up there, if you can get your body into it, whether it's through dancing or trance or singing in your case, like that has got to add some magic to the spell of course it does yeah at least for me like with singing it's like an excuse to yell (laughs) too like you can yell your petition out but it can sound good so it won't 
turn too many people off. Oh my goodness. So, <laughs> well, I know that it is probably private, but what I wouldn't give to hear you singing a petition because <laughs> you have such an incredible set of pipes. My goodness. Thank you. <laughs> You mentioned your podcast, the Witches of Atlanta podcast, and I am such a fan of the episodes that you've put out. You have had different practitioners of magic, all based in Atlanta, that you have these wonderful conversations around capitalism and sex and glamour and, (laughs) you know, all these wonderful topics. And I highly recommend people seek out those episodes. So I have to ask, do you have any plans to bring the podcast back? I know it's kind of on hiatus right now. It started like a passion project with Witch Mama, owner of ATL Craft Shop. And then we'd kind of do it for leisure because again, Witches of Atlanta was kind of primarily like it did start out as a podcast, but then it kind of grew into this like resource for people in the South since it's kind of hard out here for a witch. (laughs) But Mm -hmm. then we were getting ready to do a pod because we wanted to have a male identifying witch. And we would love to have one that is black or a person of color. And it just kind of fell through and didn't work out. Because again, it's a challenge to like get everybody's schedules to sync up. And then COVID. Oh, I know. Yeah. (laughs) And then it was like, dang it. But I mean, I like what you're doing maybe we should just try to figure out the Zoom thing and make it happen. But yeah, we'll definitely continue doing it because we have a lot more things to talk about. Sure. But yeah, right now it's kind of just like a resource for people. Yeah, well, I'll just say podcaster to podcaster that I was not that excited about Zoom when all this went down. I so prefer to be in the studio that I was usually working out of whether to do remote conversations or in-person conversations. But I'm like, if NPR is all remote right now, like (laughs) the people understand. The people understand that sound quality is not what we would hope. Yeah. And I just feel so lucky because I get to gaze at you (laughs) and, and connect to you, even though we are far away. Like I really feel your beautiful spirit right now. So I would love it if you brought your podcast back. Yeah, definitely plan on it. If yeah. and when you have the yeah. energy, understandable <laughs> that maybe you don't need another thing on your plate <laughs> at this moment. Yeah. So moving forward, what are you thinking about in terms of where to go from here In terms of your own healing, I know that's a really big question because in this very short conversation, you've brought up your personal history that you're still, you know, working through some of the shadow of, let alone what's happening in the country right now. But I think listeners, especially listeners of color, appreciate hearing from witches who are out in public and sharing whatever healing tools that they have found. So do you have anything that you think might be helpful for people? Or maybe you don't have any answers right now, and that's okay, too. (laughs) I think the biggest thing that's helping, aside from like my craft, is being able to just vent and cry in talk or whatever to my inner kind of community here. And also like a big step for me that made me feel not so helpless was making that art into something tangible that people could buy. And then that way I could donate it. So if you don't feel comfortable going out and protesting or don't feel safe or whatever, maybe that's also something that if you are feeling helpless, it can help you to feel like, well, at least I I have this and I'm doing this. And that's helped a lot. I love therapy. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Therapy is great. Yeah. So it's a culmination of things. It's also like, I would love nothing more than to, and I don't know what the rules are with this. So I'll say allegedly do some sort of psychedelics to like Mm -hmm. have some sort of ceremonial spiritual like experience. I think that can be very helpful. (laughs) So yeah, I will 
say it's amazing how that is becoming in some circles less taboo. Mm-hmm. I was just watching this documentary, Fantastic Fungi, Ooh. which is all about mushrooms. And I know that's only one version of psychedelic healing. Mm-hmm. But they were talking about how like Johns Hopkins University is proving that a lot of these plant medicines are really healing yeah. for trauma and I am not a doctor. I am not (laughs) officially condoning this or recommending this. But if you're curious, I would definitely do a little Googling. Yeah, that's, yeah, (laughs) it can be helpful. (laughs) For me, that is something that I would like to do. (laughs) I hear you. I hear you. (laughs) Well, we're unfortunately running out of time Are there any final words that you would love to share with listeners? And of course, I want you to share all of your handles and places where people can find your beautiful, delightful, dark, wonderful music (laughs) as well. I guess all I would say is that the biggest thing for me in regards to our current climate that we're in is just to like, it sounds so taboo, but just listen to each other. If somebody is telling you, from the heart, how you've crossed a boundary or you've hurt their feelings or you've whatever, just be open to receiving. It, it's not only beneficial for the person that's trying to convey this to you, it's beneficial to you too. It'll only help you grow. And that's something I'm I'm working on as well. I'm just pleading with people right now who might, if there is a chance they're listening and are already like rolling their eyes because it's a Black Lives Matter conversation predominantly, like just before you do it, just find, I don't know, somebody that is Black and ask them about their experience and really listen and then sit with it and put yourself as much as you can in their shoes and just imagine how you would feel. And I, I don't know, right now I'm just pleading with everyone to just listen to the black community with open hearts and it's needed, (laughs) you know, but Mm -hmm. that's really all I have for like a final (laughs) statement. If you will, if I can respond, I think it's so generous of you, Brooklyn, to say, like, ask me, I will say that I've had other friends of color who are like, white people do not ask me, like, do your own homework, do your own research. So just that's something to bear in mind, too. Yeah, not everyone might be in the headspace that you're into. And you might not always be in that headspace either, right? Yeah, I would definitely say, like, first, do your research. There's plenty of videos on YouTube where you can listen to Black people talk about their experience. I actually have got to a point now where I've had like some ally friends of mine be like, I'll take over because I'm depleted. So that's a very valid point. Yeah, I should rephrase and say that when I like say listen to and and ask questions, what have you, like there is the World Wide Web. There is a plethora of resources where you, if you really cared to know, you could look at statistics of police brutality. You could look at all the statistics behind systematic oppression and and all these things like it's there for you you just got to want to learn about it and not take it as an immediate attack on your character please just just Mm -hmm. like please (laughs) and I'll say as a white person who's you know just addressing my white listeners right now just asking like how can I help what can I do I want to be a better ally I've heard from my friends of color that like, they're tired. <laughs> and I and I don't want to speak for everybody. I'm just speaking for my friends right now. That a lot of the message I've been hearing is like, Google, like, <laughs> literally, there are so many books for you to read. There are literally articles that are like 75 things white <laughs> people can do to be yeah. better allies. Like, it's there, out there. there are answers out there. Please do some research yeah. and lots and lots of listening to your point, Brooklyn. So thank you for reminding us all to do that. 
And on that note, I'm going to stop talking (laughs) and ask you to tell us how we can hear more of your music and find out more about your art making and order your Witches Against White Supremacy t-shirt and other merch to support Buy From a Black Woman. Yeah, everything is at Brooklyn Music, I'm pretty sure. And then I have all the links to where you can buy it there. The actual shop that I'm selling it out of is Baby Vadu. But it, it, again, if you go to app Brooklyn Music or even Witches of Atlanta on Instagram, or if you just go to www.brooklynmusic.com, I keep everything posted there too. That's kind of where all the links are. And Brooklyn is spelled with two N's because my mom is extra. <laughs> so yeah. She's fancy. <laughs> yes. She cute. We love her. <laughs> <laughs> well, she made an incredible daughter. Brooklyn, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your music and your advocacy and your magic. It was such a great pleasure and honor to speak with you today. Thank you so much for having me. I had a wonderful time. Thank you. <laughs> That's it for the show. Thank you again to Brooklyn for her melodic manifestation and iconic illustrated spells. Do you have questions, feedback, need some witchly advice, or just want to share something magical that happened to you recently? Drop us an email at witchwavepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you and you just might make it on the witch wire. The Witch Wave is produced, written, and recorded by me, Pam Grossman. This episode was edited by Rachel Jacobs. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Rachel, and myself. Our theme music is the song Hand and Eye by Lycanthia. Special thanks go to Matt Freeman, Laura Antal, and Chiquita Pascal. You can check out information about this and other episodes on our website, and now buy Witchwave merch at witchwavepodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and give us tons of sparkly stars. It really does make a difference and helps other people find the show. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WitchwavePod, and you can check out my witch emoji for iPhone by going to witchemoji.com and downloading it in the App Store. Please consider picking up my book, Waking the Witch, which is available everywhere now. And if you want even more Witch Wave, or you would just like to support the show, please do join us over on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash witchwave. The next episode of The Witch Wave will be our season finale, but I will be continuing to put out Witch Wave Plus minisodes every other week throughout the summer. So again, Patreon is the place to get those. Thank you so much for listening. Witches are the future. I'll catch you next time on The Witch Wave.